Right, I think we'll get started. It's just gone 12, so this is the Workflow Initiative core conversation. So I'm hoping there's as much conversation as possible. Um, so for those that don't know, I'm Tim Millwood. Um, I work at AppNovation. I've been using Drupal for quite a while, um, and I'm working on the Workflow Initiative. So what have we done so far? Um, quite a lot. Um, feels like quite a lot. Um, we had a UX sprint um, in, in Amsterdam in June, and there we looked at uh, a lot of the different concepts that we're bringing from contrib modules into core and the UX issues with them and things that we should look at. Uh, main areas that we looked at were the content moderation, uh, the undo or the trash functionality, and workspaces and how workspaces are going to work and what they do and, and what they are. So we came up with a workspace concept model, and this just tries to explain what a workspace is, because when you say workspaces, nobody knows what the hell we're on about. Um, so at the top there, we've got a live workspace. This is the one that all your users see when they visit your site. And you can branch off that. You can create an upcoming event, and behind that is the live workspace. You can create a, a new product, and behind that is a live workspace. So you are branching off this live workspace, adding new content to that um, sort of branch of the workspace. And then down the bottom here, we've got a last minute fix. So you can branch off a branch and create fixes and push those up as well. So the two lines here represent uh, a push and a pull. So the push will push all of your changes. So it will just push the white part, just the changes. And then the pull will pull any upstream changes down. So on the last minute fix, we'll get all the changes from upcoming event. And on upcoming event, we'll get all the changes down from live. Um, so we've got this full sort of push and pull process on, on workspaces. So we also looked at a scenario on how <laughs> workspaces actually work in a, in a real life. So here we've got a quite a, a detailed process. Um, we set up the workspace at the start. So the bottom, the yellow one, is the live workspace and we create a, a branch of that above the, the white one. And then we can create content. So um, the, the black and white boxes within the, the white workspace represent uh, creations, changes and deletions of content within your workspace. So these can be done many times throughout the process and you can do another update then from live which is done at the third uh, step here. And then if this is okay, we carry on. If not, we look back and we keep doing changes and uh, keep updating the workspace. And workspaces can go through the full sort of um, moderation process. So you can mark them as needs review, you can mark them as published, and you can add moderation states to them and, and take them through this process. And then when we're finally all okay and we pass that okay mark, we do a final pull because we want to make sure that everything we've got is the same as live before we do our push and make sure that everything on our workspace is up on live. So when we do this pull and then push right at the end, we would also look for conflicts and make sure there are no conflicts in the content. Um, and we'll eventually need a way for resolving these conflicts. So also as part of the um, the, the UX sprint, uh, we looked at different roles, different personas, different users. Um, so we came up with this diagram here to try and explain the different roles that we have in play here. So we've got the create role uh, there at the top. These are the type of people who would create the actual content on your workspace. And then we've got the review and approve. So these are the type of people who approve the workspace, approve the content on the workspace and move it to the next moderation state. And then we have a final role of the publisher, uh, the person who actually pushes it live. So we're hoping for different permissions and different roles so you can differentiate between these different steps and only allow sort of certain people within an organization to do these. And then branching over all of this, at the bottom we have the configure role, these are sort of your administrators and your developers that have access to all this stuff and they would set it all up. Um, 
and they would configure all the sort of different moderation states and the whole flow. And then we've also got these, this manage role. Uh, these are your sort of managing editors, and these have access to all the different steps, and they can sort of override anything and um, and and have access to to the whole thing. So these are what we're thinking would be our our roles and the different permissions that we'd need. So that was pretty much all that we looked at in this in this UX sprint and. Um, all the kind of concepts we came at, up around sort of workspaces and, and the flows. Um, from a, a code point of view, in phase A, uh, we looked at a number of different uh, issues. Um, this was the phase where we were trying to get more revisions everywhere, and there was a number of issues that were underlying uh, to getting revisions everywhere. So these are some of the ones that we, we addressed. Uh, revisions are now enabled by default and content entities inherit the base fields, so things like the revision ID is inherited from uh, the, the, the content entity base. Um, we've now got revision log interface being used on node and block content. Um, revision overview has got a pager now. Um, contextual links are now different for revisions compared with the, the default revision, the live version of the entity. and non-revisionable translatable fields is quite a complex one where um, if you had a field that was translatable but not revisionable on a revisionable entity it caused a whole heap of issues so that was another one that we looked at um, so phase C is probably our only phase that is done it's content moderation um, it's in now as an experimental module there's still a whole ton of stuff we need to do to make con content moderation a stable uh, module, but um, sort of as a, as a phase, um, I'd like to think it's pretty much done. And um, we put workbench moderation into core, uh, renaming it as content moderation. We made it uninstallable because workbench moderation you can't uninstall and experimental modules need to be uninstallable. Um, and then we fixed a few bugs and cleaned up a few bits and it's all looking nice. So phase D, um, enable archive and purge storage. So I spent weeks and maybe months looking at how we can um, archive entities, how we can mark things as deleted, but not actually delete them. Um, and in contrib, we add an archive field to all entity types, and that will allow us to mark things as archived. But in core, that didn't really seem like the best approach. So we looked at, it, at changing the status field and making that a field that we can mark as deleted or mark as archived, but that blew up a whole load of other things, um, things like views that assumes a status field is Boolean, and we'd have to update every view ever on any on site. That didn't sound very fun. Um, we also looked at SQL views, um, so putting all this in the database and having a different SQL view for every different sort of status, um, but nowhere in core has SQL views at the moment, so adding that didn't really seem that fun either. Um, so this whole phase has been postponed really, um, because we didn't find a, a good solution. Um, so what we've ended up doing is, for the trash module, which depended on that archive flag, we're actually using content moderation. Content moderation already has an archive flag, so we thought, why don't we just use that? So trash will depend on content moderation and use the archive moderation state. So in contrib, we've created a 2.x branch of the contrib module. The contrib module originally uh, depended on multi-version, which is the module that had the archive flag in before. Um, so the 2.x branch depends on content moderation. It uses the archive moderation state. So we've been working quite a lot with uh, our UX team as well to try and work out some of the issues with, with Trash. Um, Trash was originally written for this session in Barcelona. So it was the 1.x branch was written in like two weeks. So there's a lot of issues with it. It didn't have any tests and it didn't work 100% of the time. Uh, but now it's getting better. <laughs> Things like the delete tab on the top of your entities now says move to trash and you click it and it moves things straight to the trash. There's no confirmation page. Um, so 
everything just goes to your trash and then you can go there and restore it. Um, and one thing I'm currently working on is when you tick all the different nodes on your um, admin content page and you do a, a bulk action to move things to deleted, it now moves the ones that can be moved to the trash to the trash and the ones that can't be moved to the trash it gives you the confirmation page because it's based on content moderation and content moderation is per bundle so per content type we have to do different things for different bundles um, so yeah there's a lot of checks in trash to see if a bundle is moderated um, so yeah that's pretty much the state on trash and I'm hoping that pretty soon we can get that in as an experimental module and in, in 8.3 I'm hoping it will it will be there so these are some of the UIs that we've been looking at for trash um, so this would be the trash um, so you see we've got a number of different uh, entity types um, so we've they're all mixed together and it's just your overall list of, of trash uh, what we were thinking was on your desktop machine if you put an image in the trash and if you put a text file in the trash and a word document in the trash they're all there together you don't have a separate trash for every type of, of file so we're putting all entity types in together and from there you'll be able to restore or actually delete um, entities so restoring them will take them back to the moderation state that they had before um, one thing we're still trying to work out is what is before um, so we've got to kind of work out from the revisions, um, what would be the revision before the revision that you put it in the trash, and what if you were doing forward revisions? Um, so if you had a published revision, and then you created a draft revision, and then you send a published revision to the trash, what happens to the draft re revision? Um, and does the when you send something to the trash, it creates a new revision, it creates a trash to revision, so that then bunny hops your draft revision, your your forward revision. So when it goes back, does it go back to your draft revision or does it go back to your published revision? How we did it, do we know which one is which? So we've got a whole load of sort of complex issues. So if anyone's got any ideas, I'm happy to take those. Um, we're also adding an undo link to the trash. So when you add something to the trash, you'll be able to undo it. Um, and that doesn't have a confirmation form either. You just click undo and it undoes. Um, again, we got the same issue. What do we go back to? Um, what revision does it go back to because we don't know once you move something to the trash we've added a new revision we've added the trash date the most sensible thing would be to go back to this situation just before you push the button so that and you remove your trash revision and you go back in the state you were so the published node is the published one that was there the draft is drafted that was forward draft right so the question was why don't we just go back it's not as we were. Perhaps not as simple to do technically, but logically it seems the most sensible thing you do. Yeah, that's yeah. actually what we decided. That we were yeah, so we are looking to go, to go back. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether it, it is so easy to know what, what the riv how it was before. Um, because after you create a new revision, it's not 100% clear what the revision before was and what the state was before. Um, but we can probably try and work it out. Um, but yeah, we do need to give that some thought. Has any thought been given to how that would interact with workflows? So like when, if you pull in changes <coughs> and then someone actually deletes something from the live site and sort of the restore process behind that and getting it back across any necessary workflows? Um, so the question was how, how would it work with workflows and um, yeah, it's it's something we need to think about um, because we don't really store much information at the moment about workflows and and the the process or the states that things have been through and we are storing in content moderation all the different states that a entity has um, and they all have an order because they have a sequential revision ID but if someone's creating um, a draft when you've got something published and that's got a forward revision, a, a higher revision ID, but then when you delete the published revision, then that's got a higher revision than the draft one. Um, so as I was saying earlier, you've got the issue of you don't really know what you're going back to. Um, 
feels like it should have the, 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 the revision should have awareness of who's my parent. Right. So yeah, the question was the revision needs to know who's who's its parent, and that's something I will get to in a in a bit because in the contrib modules we have got revision parents. Um, so yeah, we can definitely look at using that. So on to what's next, and the UX stuff. Um, still a lot of work there to do, uh, mainly around workspaces. So we need to get the name incorrect um, when we say workspaces. No one knows what we're on about. So is workspace the best name? Should it be site version, site revision, something else? Um, definitely open for suggestions there. Um, we need to come up with some prototypes around the whole sort of workflow, the user interface, and do some user testing around that, just to make sure that it all kind of makes sense and, and works. Um, one thing that we've got already in, in Contrib is moderation states on workspaces. So you can move a workspace between draft, needs review, and published, <laughs> and trashed. Um, and so when you publish a workspace, it automatically uh, moves all the content from that workspace to its parent workspace. Um, so much like in uh, a Git workflow, every branch has got an upstream branch. So we'd have that similar sort of thing with workspaces where everything would have an upstream and it would just automatically merge up to its upstream. Um, but does that make sense? It makes sense to me, but it doesn't make sense to the people who are actually using it. So then in phase A, um, I said earlier we've done a load of stuff in phase A, but we've still got a really big issue outstanding, and that's to make things revisionable. And it's very easy to make things revisionable, um, but the upgrade path is incredibly hard, and moving all of your content from a non-revisionable entity schema to a revisionable entity schema is pretty complex. Um, so we've got a lot of work done already on there. Um, but we just need to try and get it past the line and, and get it done. So in phase B, um, we're looking to extend the revision API with revision hashes, revision parents, and uh, an upgrade path that generates all of these. So the revision hash is a hash of the revision. So if uh, user A creates a change to an entity and user B creates exactly the same change, they will generate the same revision hash. So we can just look at the hash and we know that they're both pretty much the same revision. And then revision parents will allow us to see this full sort of path of where revisions come from. And this will definitely help the trash issues, um, but it also allows us to resolve replication issues. Uh, when we're replicating content between workspaces and between sites, we, we know exactly where the revisions have come from. Um, and then the upgrade path, we, as I said, we need to generate all these, so we're going to have to go through every entity on your site and generate a hash and work out the parents. So we've still got the problem of, of what is the, the parent revision. Um, I guess we could just assume that it's the sequential revision ID, um, but again, we're open to suggestions. Um, so phase F is when we hope to add in a lot of um, workspace stuff, and it's debatable on whether this depends on the revision hash and revision uh, parents. So we can definitely add workspaces into core very soon and they don't need the revision hashes or the revision parents but they will need them when we start doing um, replication between workspaces is is there any point adding workspaces before we can replicate content between the workspaces do we add workspaces to core now and leave the replication in contrib Yeah. allows you to get workspaces as a basis into core and get something that probably will already be useful for a number of people and for a number of people to start using it without having all the complexity of solving the hash and the uh, replication issue because if you only have two uh, workspaces the replication logic becomes a lot more manageable I, think I, I guess so the, the, the comment was about having limited workspaces so basically only two workspaces uh, 
a stage and a live and it makes it a lot simpler. But I don't want to get into the situation where we add stuff into core that we then have a problem when we try and add more stuff in that we've actually got to take out what we first oh, started amazing. with. And we've already got all this working in Contrib. Um, but I did write a blog post a few weeks ago where I said that it's really not that easy to just move it into core. Um, so I'm not saying because we've got it in Contrib it's easy, but we've got all this stuff working. We just need to try and sort of port it over. And a lot of the um, the logic that we've got for replicating between workspaces we've taken from CouchDB and how that does the replication. Um, so it's a pretty sort of solid process. Um, so I think that's... I'm not going to say an easy bit, but it's relatively straightforward. Sort of, we know what we're doing because there's tried and tested ways to do this replication. Um, but it's definitely quite a bit of work to, to get it done. Um, but currently in, in Contrib, we add workspaces in the multi-version module, which is like the base, the base module. And you can't actually do anything with those workspaces until you add the subsequent Contrib modules. Um, so that's what we could look at doing in core initially is the experimental workspace module does little more than just adding the workspaces and then we just have the contrib modules to do the replication until we get to subsequent um, core releases. Um, or we could go down the Drupal 7 route and you have your stage workspace and you can just copy and paste everything over to your live workspace and that will do your replication. Um, so yeah, there's still a lot, lot to think about on, on workspaces. Um, we've also been looking at what CPS did as a module in, in Drupal 7. Um, it's a very similar concept to workspaces, and development seemed to start on both CPS and workspaces at about the same sort of time, and they went in slightly different directions, but the end product is very similar. Um, so we need to try, try and look at the best ideas from both and try and um, and work out what we can can do to get the best end product. Um, so on the bottom there I've also got um, entity indexes. Um, so this is one thing that we use quite a lot in, in the Contrib modules is we've got uh, an index for a UUID for revision hash and then also a sequence index. So this allows us to do fast lookups by UUID of an entity, by hash of revision, and the sequence is we store a log of every entity change on the whole site. So much like a git log, um, we can look at the sequence log and know exactly what's happened between uh, sequence item A and sequence item B. Um, so that's going to be pretty important when we start looking at, at replication. So um, also in this phase, we've got a couple of services. Um, these are the services that we use in, in Contrib at the moment to do our application. So the changes service will um, allow us to get the changes from, um, from a workspace and then the revisions diff service will allow us to diff those changes between a workspace. So we're only replicating the, the entities that have changed, the revisions that have changed. Um, so the replication that happens is, is often very small because we're only taking the changes. Um, so these are some of the um, services that we need to get in place to get the replication working. Um, and we've got the whole sort of replication API. Um, at the moment, we're using tag services in Contrib. Um, that seems to work pretty well in that more modules can define a different way to do replication, and it will just loop through each way to do replication until it finds the one that applies. Um, so in Contrib, we've got single site replication where it replicates from one workspace to another on a single site and then we've got site to site replication which goes over HTTP to a completely different site and these are just two different tag services and it just looks to see which one it's going to use. And then there's also the conflict API and this is something that we had a Google Summer of Code student work on over the summer and a they've come up with a great way to do um, three-way merges between entities. So we can get um, two revisions of an entity and the revision parent and do a three-way merge between those. And hopefully we can uh, get this in to sort of auto-resolve any conflicts that there are. Is there a module for 
Um, so the question was, is there a module for that? And there is the conflict module, which is where the work is going on. Um, it doesn't really do a lot at the moment. All the underlying code is in um, separate PHP services, so we've made it very decoupled from Drupal itself. And then we're going to pull that into the Drupal module, so it will be able to resolve conflicts with entities. But at the moment, it's resolving conflicts with just um, random data with like arrays. Um, so we would take an entity and, and put it down to an array and then resolve the conflict at that level. Um, and that's what the PHP service is doing. Um, so then phase G um, is kind of the, the final phase really and it's where we look at um, polishing all of the UIs and making sure there's a really nice way to replicate your content between workspaces, to create workspaces, to manage all of the moderation states on them, um, the full sort of conflict UI, so you, maybe you want to just pick which revision do you want um, the, from the conflicting revisions, or maybe you do want to carry out a full um, merge yourself and get the sort of traditional four panes and, and do all the merging yourself. Um, so we're thinking of trying to build a very flexible um, conflict UI with different plugins maybe, so there's different ways to do to do conflicts. Um, so that's pretty much it on what we've done and what we've still got coming up. So if anyone wants to step up to the mic, I'm happy to sort of take questions, but more sort of open up discussions on on what you think and what you want to work on, what views do you have. Um, yeah, it's an open floor, really. Um, so the uh, my name is Jess. I'm XJM on Drupal.org. Um, the trash module UI that you had up there, I'm assuming that was not a view because it had multiple entity types in it. Is that correct? Um, that was just a mock-up. But we ah, are. you didn't mock. <laughs> so it definitely wasn't. It a definitely view. wasn't a view. <laughs> but we are hoping to do it with views because mm -hmm. it's a list of content moderation states. It's not oh, a okay, list so of entities. Oh, okay. So the base table is the content moderation states. Exactly. Beautiful. Okay. Thanks. Hi, I'm Daniel Wilner. I also have some views. Um, so I was wondering about the workspaces bit. You were talking about experimental modules if for that kind of stuff, and I was wondering whether yeah. that's really the right approach. Because, I mean, workspaces or the live stuff would have to be taken into account everywhere, right? Yeah. So I was wondering like, whether that's the right approach there. Um, um, just, just, just it. Yeah. It's, it's an open discussion still, but I think experimental modules are definitely the way in Drupal 8 to add new features to core. Um, but we do get into a whole load of issues then that it's got to be something that is turn on and offable. Um, and we've already seen in putting workbench moderation in that we had to rewrite a whole chunk of it to make it uninstallable. Um, so, yeah, a bit still to see whether that's the right approach or not, but it seems possible that we can do it as an experimental module and um, and store all the information in some sort of meta table or entity type. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried because um, like workspaces are like a new dimension of problems. Yeah. So if you want to test a new dimension of problems, you would have to add this dimension to any test theoretically in order to really test it. But if you have an experiment, what you would you, you need to know, you you don't know what you want to test for. Right. Um. So I was. Well, um, one, one option. I mean, the one same is the same is with, with, with translations, right? Yep. We have translations baked into the core because it's a fundamental part of what we have to think about. No, that's just that's just the UI or yeah. data. But so we yeah. could look at um, just that and putting the API into core itself, and then the the UI as a experimental module. Um, oh yeah, that's that's definitely an option. But then we've got to look at um, if someone only has one workspace, if if they use Drupal eight as it currently is, we've still got to send them through the whole API of of workspaces and the whole lookup of does this content belong in this workspace or does it not? Um, 
So we're going to have to manage the whole sort of performance around that. Um, and I know CPS in Drupal 7 did it in pretty clever ways, so we'll probably call on them to help. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that we need to think about. Uh, I'm Tobias, T. Stuckler on Drupal.org. Uh, this is not really a question, just something kind of to throw at you to see if you have thoughts on that. Because mm -hmm. um, we have the change field on a bunch of entities. Um, so basically, whenever you um, whenever you press save on an entity, it updates the timestamp. And I'm wondering how that fits into the whole entity hash thing, because like whenever you save it, you have a different change timestamp. So yeah. there's definitely going to be like a change, but then does that really count or not? Or like yeah. so. Yeah. So in, in the contrib modules where we're generating the hash now, we exclude a number of fields um, like revision ID and changed that are different between revisions and we generate the hash, not including those. Um, and because the way we generate the hash is consistent, it will always be the same if you generate it on site one or site two. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much how we do it. Um, but we will have to take into account if some random contrib module is adding another field in that does similar stuff, Yeah, how do we manage it? Um, do we generate the hash of just known fields? Um, I don't know. Again, it's something that we need to need to look at. That probably shouldn't be at least clickable or hookable to change it from the module that you add fields. Yeah. So the comment is it should be hookable or pluggable, and yeah, it probably should be. Well, uh, especially like when when it comes to translations, because like the change field is translatable. Um, so we have like a change timestamp across translations. So, or in general, like how do the the hashes work uh, when it comes to translations? I'm not sure to be honest, um, but yeah, again, we're gonna have to definitely take that into account. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Doug Green, I uh, also did some work on the CPS and just a bunch of random thoughts. Uh, uh, you mentioned archiving of, uh, were you talking about archiving of versions or archiving of entities or both? Because we ran into lots of problems with CPS that keeping track of all of our revisions, the tables got huge and we ended up archiving in files instead of. Right, so we're looking at archiving an entity as a whole, um, but the archive is denoted by um, the latest or the default revision being archived with the moderation state. Um, we're probably going to allow a setting to choose what is your sort of trash state or your archived state. Um, so each bundle potentially could have a different trash state. Um, but if the default revision has that state, then it will be archived. Um, so essentially, it's um, the same as any other revision in the entity API. It's just got a different moderation state and a moderation state in, in content moderation is just a config entity so um, it's no different to needs review or any other moderation state really it's just sort of a, a special state so yes we probably will get into the problem of having big tables with lots of revisions um, it, it got exponential when you started looking at the uh, workspaces uh, that you had basically every copy of every revision in every workspace and it just right. balloons. Yeah, it's definitely something we need to... Uh, the other thing that I, I saw that, uh, well, I've got a few others, so, uh, in your workflow states, uh, we, we found that language translation was a workflow state that needed to be in there. So it wasn't just content editors, reviewers, approvers, there was a workflow state for each language in addition to that. Okay, that's interesting. Um, you mentioned uh, trash, and I was wondering, aren't, isn't trash done in a workspace, or are you trashing the live version? Um, potentially, you could trash a live version, um, and we are looking at replicating uh, trashed states. So if you trash something in stage and you replicate stage to live, it will become trashed in live as well. Um, but you, potentially, you, if you had the right permissions, you could go on to live and trash it, uh, trash a, an entity, that is. Um, so we, I think we need to leave it flexible enough from a p permissions point of view that if someone does have the use case that they want to 
accomplish something in life that they can. The, the, the last thought I had where, where, you know, this has made a different uh, design decisions than, than we did, the replication wasn't really necessary. We weren't replicating from one site to another site. The revision control was all controlled within a single site. Are you complicating this model right now thinking about replication? It's kind of, you know, I'm throwing that out there. Yeah. Um, coming from the contrib um, background of all this, the main goal was for site-to-site -site replication and for that we looked at the CouchDB uh, way of working um, because the replication there is, is very solid, there's a very good protocol, very good API. Um, so we copied the same principles when we looked at single site replication. So maybe we are over complicating it, um, but I think it currently in Contrib anyway works, works pretty well and, and does what we need. Um, but for core, I definitely think we need to look at it and whether whether it is creating too many revisions or too many entities when we do a replication. So actually, on that point, the the having you know the axes of revision, translation, and workspace for every entity type, I thought that you said something about a a diffing API. Um, maybe this isn't related, but. Wouldn't it be, so if, if a workspace has a parent workspace that is by default just the live workspace, yeah. um, wouldn't it be that you only need to store entities that are different? Like you only need to store the things that are different in whatever workspace than the parent workspace, and so that greatly reduces the number of duplicated yeah. records that you need to have for everything, and then also simplifies the total space, which in, was like, I think, four-dimensional at that point, but now it's only like three and part of some. Yeah. In theory. <laughs> I think the problem there, Jess, is that if changes in the... Come, come use the mic. Sorry. Hi, I'm Brian, reality with Contribute.org. I think the problem there might be that if changes happen in the parent that create a difference in the, the, the other one, that's not going to be tracked. So when you go to push it back, it's... Right. Harder to but if you make a change in the parent, then you do an update and it pull the change down. Yeah, the update. Um, but then you'd get a conflict and you'd have to resolve your conflict. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, it's based very much on Git. Um, so yeah, we do really only need to store the changes. Um, we went through a lot of iterations in the contrib modules on how we store things. Um, and got into a lot of complications. And currently in Contrib, we store everything multiple times, and that, that can be pretty hard. I think in CPS, it, it does just store changes. Um, so yeah, it needs a lot more discussion, and there's sprints this week, so. <laughs> so um, uh, Kevin O'Leary, TK O'Leary on, on Drupal.org. Um, I'm totally applaud the, um, I mean, everything's awesome. This is really, really great stuff, and it's, it's very <laughs> badly needed. Um, and I, I total, I, I'm totally for the idea of it being on multiple sites and being able to replicate across multiple sites, because I think that, um, you know, that, that if we look broadly at, you know, what's happening in the, in the world of um, large organizations using Drupal, this is what they want to do. They want to have a more of a sort of a, a, a meta site yep. that 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 crosses their entire organization and links all their content together. We've seen this at Acquia, and this is why we have Content Hub and why other people have done other things, you know, similar to that. And um, but I think you know, looking at your whole plan um, uh, from beginning to end, I think every step is really important. I feel like the step of sort of let's clean up these UIs um, and make a good uh, sort of um, mental model or uh, you know sort of way that the user can understand um, how to resolve conflicts and do merges and things like that being the last step is a mistake right because um, because the way that the users uh, understand the mental model and the way that we construct the actual data model are inextricably linked, right? And um, we need to map things to the way that the users, you know, are going to want to understand the, the, the data model. And, and people mentioned Git. And, you know, Git is a really good example of um, 
of a tool which is incredibly powerful, but which, uh, for which ever since it was created, app developers you know, have started creating <laughs> all kinds of different ways of visualizing you know, the, the tree. Yep. And, um, and, and creating different kinds of applications to visualize diffing or, 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 or mapping the tree or doing different kinds of things that, that they can, where, they, where they can create a visual model so that the user can understand the mental model of how things get replicated and how, and how I move back up the chain and where, what branch am I on and, 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 and where am I in this, in this whole structure. And I think that if we, if we work on the visual model of the UI for that, much, much earlier in the process, mm -hmm. that it's also going to tease out and help us to resolve issues around what's important about the data model. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And we have already been thinking a little bit about moving some of the UI stuff a bit earlier, because I know there's um, some interest in getting bigger UI pieces into each uh, release of, of Drupal 8, um, but it's sometimes hard to get in these UI changes if you don't have the, the API behind them, um, so yeah, we need to definitely think about some of this stuff. Um, also, we'd like to try and keep the UI as simple as possible um, and maybe even pluggable so that with core, you get a nice simple UI where you just sort of change a moderation state on a workspace and it's published. And then we sort of need to look at sort of what published means. Does it push up to the upstream and does it delete that workspace after it's published? All these kind of questions. But try and keep it as simple as, as possible. And then we can have these add on modules that do different ways of replication, that do the cross site replication, that allow you to sort of do other, I don't know, crazy not just replicate to the upstream, but replicate to some other workspace or to multiple workspaces at once. Um, so we could have a sort of content hub type thing where you can replicate out to 10 sites at once. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to keep it flexible, but have a nice, a nice basic UI. So we do need to think about it early and we have got UX people trying to sort of solve these problems fairly early on. Um, right. Like the, the trash stuff, the UI, so that we're done uh, quite a while ago, and it's only the last few weeks that we've actually started working on, on building it. So hopefully if the, the UX people can start getting um, sort of a perfect world ideal UI early on, and then we can try and work how we can fit the API to make that happen, and what the MVP kind of steps would be uh, to get there. So. Right. I think what I what I heard, and maybe this was uh, wait, maybe I was mishearing, um, you know, was that we would have you know you would have the API in much the same way that Git is what it is and provides no no UI, and then you know people could create their own UIs that visualize the revision the revision stack in different kinds of ways, and that's where I think we run into problems from from a usability perspective and a consistency perspective across Drupal. And here is a place where I feel like we need to be opinionated in our design, if not necessarily in our in our code, more opinionated in the design than in the in the underlying code. Because if we have a cohesive and logical visual model of what the tree looks like yeah. uh, to a user, that can be extended and added on to. I mean, you can add on sort of icons that represent replicate across sites or replicate within sites, things like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that everyone uses this sort of single model um, uh, to, describe, to describe the tree, that it becomes a kind of a touchstone that we can all kind of latch onto. Oh, well, this is how we all understand it. Even becomes easier for us to describe things to one another right. because we can just throw it up on the board and say, oh, well, it's here. And, you're on this node, and then it goes. You know what I mean? Yep. In much the same way that you created the diagram in your in your presentation. Yeah. You know, it gives you something that you can hold on to. Yeah. So. so I think initially, when we started looking at the initiative back in New Orleans, it was very much the plan to build all the API first, build the UI afterwards, um, and we quickly came to found that we need more UI in in earlier on. So I think that's 
changing more and more and as we keep going I'm sure we'll get more UI in earlier and um, yeah I, I, I think we do need the UI in earlier but I'm just still concerned about the the API and the, the data model and how we even do a sort of a simple entity query now we've got <coughs> workspaces and entities that can live in multiple places and more revisions in one workspace than another and all this crazy data yeah yeah, it's 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 coming along great though. Thanks. I mean, I think the place where we are at now is 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 is, is good. You know? Great. And I'll definitely become more involved in the in the uh, in the design part as well. Thank you. Uh, so to Kevin's comment, I think it's important to distinguish when we do work from when work lands in core. Um, so while I agree that it's very important to have design very early in the process so that we know what it is that we're building in a way that's available to everyone, um, at the same time that doesn't mean that the you, as adding the user interface itself can still be phase F that doesn't land for several years. Um, I think that uh, like the Workspace Initiative has already demonstrated that it can put user-facing changes in core. It's already demonstrated progress and success as an initiative, so I want to roll back the pressure a little bit to have user facing changes in every release of, of every minor release yeah. because that's um, you know it, it's also a very complicated problem that we need to get right and so um, there will be other great user facing features that land in 8.3 and make 8.3 a release of Drupal that people want to install the, this pressure doesn't need to be only on your initiative okay. um, but I, I do agree that that having those having the design work done early so that we know what we're building and then can actually build that, which involves not only having the design for the user interface, but actually the APIs that make the functionality that it exposes work yeah. can be separate things. Yeah, and I, I think the concern I have that even though we can add all this as experimental modules so that we can sort of rip it out and start again and change things and it can be API breaking, the data still needs to be all intact and, and working, so we need to get that work and perfect really to start with so I think that's going to be the tricky first step with workspaces specifically great any other questions no I think we're good so the only final thing I've got is that there's a boff at 2.15 so right after lunch so if anyone wants to start discussing some of this stuff or if you've got any other ideas then I'll be there in the boff and happy to hear any ideas and suggestions. Um, and then we're sprinting on Friday, so I'll be there on Friday um, trying to get trash ready to go into core. Um, and then there are sprints on Saturday and Sunday, even though I'm not there. Um, there will be people sprinting on this stuff. So thank you.